Hi, this is Jason Nickleby, coordinator of officials with the Minnesota State High School League, and this is basketball officiating training tape number four. Um, we're in the heart of the conference season still, about a month ago. Um, I know we're in a grind, but keep working hard. We're doing well, and uh, let's just stick with it. We'll have a couple plays with traveling, uh, block charge, and technical foul administration on this tape. And again, not looking to pick on any one player or team or official, just looking to learn from these plays and how we can handle these situations if they come up in our games. So with that, we'll get to the plays. On this play, we'll have a traveling violation called by the trail, uh, properly so. And again, traveling is something that we struggle with at all levels of basketball. And it gets called a lot of things, Euro step, drop step, um, you know, spin move, all sorts of things. The bottom line is we're looking for the pivot foot and what the pivot foot can do or can't do. So um, again, we need to review rule 444. I think I've said that in a few other tapes as well. And it's a, again, a rule that we need to review and, and just really work hard at picking up the pivot foot and knowing what they can do and can't do with that foot. So. In this case, I think we have an, a couple of travels involved in this play, and we get the first one, but um, you'll see in the replay that when she catches the ball, she establishes the pivot foot as the right foot, then picks that up and puts it back down and picks it up to start a dribble. So um, you have a multiple travels because, again, if you pick up the pivot foot to pass or shoot, you're fine. But if you pick up the pivot foot to start a dribble, um, then that is a traveling violation. So in this case, uh, right foot, pivot foot, picks it up to dribble, not to pass or shoot. This is a traveling violation and was properly called by the trail. I wanted to use this play example to talk about technical foul administration and how we work through that. Um, We'll have a foul called by the lead, and then a subsequent technical foul uh, is called. So a um, couple things here. We call the technical foul. That's fine. We're very calm, under, under control, um, keep our composure. Um, sometimes that happens with technical fouls. Sometimes we get a little emotional. So it's always good to get together with our crewmates um, so that we can discuss what we called, what we saw, and then how we're going to move ahead. So. Um, I like that this officiating crew got together, discussed what they're going to do, then the calling official reports to the table, and then goes and gives a calm explanation to the coach about why the technical foul was called. Um, if we feel that we can't have that conversation with the coach um, at the current time, and maybe it can wait, then let's send another crewmate over there to have that discussion with the coach. Um, but it's good that we went over there and gave the explanation. And then when we're administering the free throws, um, this is just something to point out. The rule book does not mention that the players have to be behind half court. I think that's just something that we've always done. And um, I think people just blindly do that, which is fine. But by rule, if, uh, if coaches... Um, want to talk to their players and it's on that half of the court as long as they remain behind the three-point line and behind the free throw line extended then they can be there so um, just something to uh, be reminded of and then trail and center uh, especially the center um, if the trail is talking to the coach we need to be in position to view players um, just get in a position to view players it's not as important that we are in position to view potential violations on the free throw shooter. Um, leads can help out with that. If we, I don't recall a violation on the free throw shooter for technical foul free throws um, in games that I've worked, but um, let's not be as concerned about that. Let's just be in position to view, to view players. So um, again, um, we call it, we're under control. It's just another foul. Then we communicate with our crew about what we have report it to the table, make sure that they count uh, the proper number of fouls and, and so forth with the board and with the book, and then communicate with the coach about what, 
what you have and why you had the technical foul, and then move ahead. Lead, administer the free throws. Center, you'd be in your normal position, except if you need to adjust to view players. And then trail, you will be at the uh, half court division line, um, unless you're going to communicate with the coach about what you had, and then you can go back to your normal uh, position. And we will follow that with a throw in at the division line um, to begin uh, the next sequence of plays. So again, this was handled well by the crew, nice and calm, just another foul. Communicate with your crew what you have, report, and then administer. On this play, we have a transition play. We hustle back to get in position, and we're going to have a verticality play, no called on this play. And I want to talk about transition coverage and restricted area, verticality, block charge, all that kind of stuff. So again, we've talked about before leads. We might have to take it from behind uh, the players to see if we can get a better view or stop and take a look at the play, which is what the lead does in this situation, which I think is totally fine. It gives us a better look versus being on the move. Totally fine with that. Um, now, we, in this case, we have a one-on-one -on -one transition play, which means the restricted area does not apply. It's a regular block charge verticality play, just like we've had in the past. This defensive player establishes legal guarding position facing her opponent and then backs up to maintain that legal guarding position. So this is a legal play by the defensive player, and so it's either a no call or an offensive foul at worst. So I think a no call is the proper call. We're in proper position. We stop to view the play, and then we properly no call this play. Um, if this transition play was two on one, three on two, then this play would be a restricted area blocking foul because we are in the restricted area, but in this case, it is a one-on-one -on -one play, which means it is a regular verticality play, and it is properly no called by the lead. On this play, we'll have a dribble drive down the uh, lane line closest to the bench. Number three establishes the right foot as the pivot foot, picks it up, puts it back down again, and is properly called for a traveling violation by the trail. Um, Again, we've talked about the rule, and we need to review 444, know what they can and can't do with the pivot foot, and that's our key. We really need to pick up the pivot foot so that we know what they can do. Um, mechanically, this play is going away from the C into the trails area. It's now his primary responsibility to officiate this play. Um, it's moving towards the lead, but it's not quite into her area of responsibility and the trail takes it. Now, if it makes it all the way down to the block, then the lead uh, could help. But again, trails and centers, we need you to work a step or two lower so you can help with traveling violations so that the lead can concentrate on contact and whether it's a legal play from that perspective. So in this case, leaves the center's area into the trail's area of responsibility, and he takes it. If it makes it all the way down to the block, Trail, you're still going to help with traveling violations, but lead, it would be your primary responsibility um, for contact and foul. So well done by the crew, right foot up and down, properly called by the trail official. Okay, let's talk about the mechanics of officiating this play. So you'll see that the ball will rotate over to the bench side in front of the C, and then we'll have a drive to the basket from the C's primary responsibility. So when you see the ball rotate over to that side of the floor, you'll see that the lead moves towards the lane line. So she's closing down, and then when it just settles just for a little bit on that bench side, you'll see that she's slightly inside the lane line. This is a concept called pinching the paint. It means that we're putting ourselves in position to ultimately flex if the ball settles on that side. But in this case, we have an immediate drive to the basket. The contact is involving a primary defender, which means the center will take this play all the way to the basket. If this play involves contact with a secondary defender in the paint, the lead will be the primary ruling official for that play. 
If there's no secondary defender involved, and this is a one-on-one -on -one matchup like we have here from center side, the center will take this play all the way to the basket, which he does here. Um, so, again, ball rotates over to the other side. You'll see the, lay, the lead close down, take a step inside the paint, which means they're pinching the paint, which puts them in good position to ultimately rotate and flex if the ball settles on that side. It doesn't settle, they go right to the basket, but we're in good position to help if any kind of contact occurs with a secondary defender in the lane or restricted area. Um, so if we pinch the paint and the ball settles, go ahead and flex and rotate. If it doesn't, it comes back out to the top, then you can step out and be in that closed down position, which is one step outside the lane line. So leads, we're gonna mirror the ball um, as, as the lead, we're gonna mirror the ball. If the ball goes to the other side like it does here, we're going to close down, pinch the paint, and then flex and rotate if the ball settles. If it doesn't settle, we can move back to close down position on the same side that we're on. So um, this play is handled well by the crew, very well done mechanically. Um, the best part about this is even though the lead pinched the paint, she trusted her partner to take that play from his primary area of responsibility, and she allowed him to officiate that play all the way to the basket from his area. And this is well done, very nice partner trust, and excellent mechanics by the crew. Okay, we just talked about pinching the paint and then drives from center side and then contact with a secondary defender um, or a primary defender play like we had in the previous example. So in this case, we're gonna have a um, player control foul contact with a secondary defender that is called um, by the lead official. So first, let's talk about mechanics. So you'll see that the, the lead pinches the paint because we're gonna have a play coming from the other side and that's fine. We don't have enough time to flex or rotate. So we're gonna take it from, from that pinch the paint position, which is about a step inside the lane line. Um, couple other things mechanically. Leads, make sure that we put a fist in the air um, before we punch. I know as leads we're very emotional and we're more likely to sky right and ship it um, without putting a fist in the air. I know I'm, I'm terrible at that, but it really helps slow us down and keeps us out of trouble if we uh, put a fist in the air. Second thing, um, centers. If you have a whistle on this play, um, all we should do is a fist and then we can always get out of that because if a coach asks us, well, what do you have? Well, I have a foul. Um, it's different from the other guy, but we don't have to tell him that. We just need to keep our fists in the air. That way we can get out of a barge by just posting and holding, okay? Um, also, centers. If it's a primary matchup from your area, then you should be able to take it all the way to the basket. In this case, it's contact with a secondary defender in the paint. We should leave that primary ruling to the lead because they know how that uh, defender got there or not. Um, now, for the actual play itself, last year, this was properly called as an offensive foul because the defensive player establishes legal guarding position prior to the offensive player leaving the floor. This year, secondary defender establishes legal guarding position in the restricted area. He is grounded when contact is made. Therefore, this should be a restricted area blocking foul this season. Last year, properly called as an offensive foul. This year would be a restricted area blocking foul. All right, on this play, we have another block charge example. You'll see that the lead flexes, uh, rotates to the other side and then we have an offensive foul on this play. So a couple things mechanically. Um, I'm fine with the flex and rotation by the lead, puts him on the ball side where it settles, 
and that should put us in good position to view um, the majority of plays. Um, make sure that we, we get as much depth as we can. We don't want to be on the floor. We want to be uh, back as far as we can. I know in this particular situation, it's hard to work deep, but we'll try to get uh, a little deeper so that we have a really good perspective on this play because this contact is involved with a secondary defender in the restricted area. So the primary for ruling on this uh, particular play would be the lead official um, center. Um, I like how we close down when this play goes to the basket. That puts us in really good position to help. Um, the only thing we want to do differently here is, again, make sure we post and hold. Um, this is a pretty clear offensive foul under last year's um, rule and guidance. Um, but we just want to make sure that we don't have a blarge. So just make sure we post and hold. And then if lead doesn't have it for some reason, then we can go ahead and take it. So um, leads, make sure we work a little bit deeper. This is your primary because it's contact with a secondary defender. Center, I like how we close down and we're in good position to help. If we have a whistle on this play, we should just post and hold and then we can ship it if for some reason um, the lead does not have it. However, this year um, with the restricted area uh, rule, we have a secondary defender who establishes legal guardian position in the restricted area. He is grounded when contact is made. Therefore, this should be a restricted area blocking foul and the lead should put a fist in the air, signal block, and then point at the restricted area. This would be the proper mechanic for handling this play. So last year, properly ruled as a player control foul. This year, a grounded secondary defender in the restricted area should result in a blocking foul. Okay, a couple more play examples for you. Hopefully these are helpful for you. Again, officiating is not easy. It's not for everybody. Um, but the officials we have in Minnesota do a great job with these plays, and um, these are really tough plays, and there's something to talk about, and make sure that we're mechanically on the same page as a crew. Make sure we pregame these type of plays, and who's going to take them as primary, secondary, and how to handle double whistles and communication with players and coaches. So again, we're doing a great job. Keep working on that. Keep working hard, and uh, we'll talk to you in a couple weeks.